Sue, over to you. Thank you for your today. Everyone else will be muted now by Vicky. Hello, I'm, I'm Sue Carter and I work with Amber Cuff. We're both solicitors and we work in an office in Brockenhurst. Um, we've been here, well, I've been here for about 15 to 20 years, so it's quite a long time. There's also a small office in Limington where there's a notary, um, someone called Michael Dew, who does some consultancy work for us. Um, we mainly um, deal with non-contentious non work, which is non-court work, and we do a lot of work to do with wills, lasting powers of attorney, estates, and we have a number of elderly clients. Um, conveyancing, which is an interesting um, area at the moment, um, and we try our best to try and help people. Amber's fairly newly qualified. She's doing very well. She's much better at technology than me, um, and she's the one who's who started the Zoom meetings with, with clients. So um, we will try, um, what we're going to do is we're going to talk mainly about wills and powers of attorney. Um, we thought we'd split the talk, talk, which means that you won't get too fed up with my voice. Um, and it, it, it might make it more interesting for you. So Amber's going to start off um, and just give you a few reasons why you should make a will. Hi, um, I'm Amber from Ross Carter. Amber, um, sorry. There are many reasons. Yeah, I'm a bit quiet. So, Sorry. Can you hear Amber? Can you hear me? Not quite. No, that's worse. No, but it's not coming through. Um Sorry, we're, we're, we're working in different areas of the house. It, it should work up in the office. Um, I'm just going to come and use my machine, so sorry about okay. this. That's okay. And I will social distance while she... Thank you. And meanwhile, Heidi's kindly put some notes up about um, furlough and uh, also particularly, and this question's come to us recently at NFBP, about okay. comp company directors with an annual pay period. Um, so. There we go. Amber's now appeared upstairs. Hi. Hi, Spetta. Thank you. Um, so there are many reasons that you might want to make a will, particularly in light of, of the current circumstances and regardless of health and age. Having a will in place ensures that your wishes will be honoured in relation to your assets once you pass away. This can also provide you with reassurance and peace of mind during your lifetime. A few specific examples that you may wish to consider is if you um, have young children or who are under 18. You can make provision in your will to appoint guardians after your passing. If your will is silent on the age that they may inherit, um, they will inherit at 18, but you can make provision for them to inherit later if you think appropriate, for example, 21 or 25. Um, you may wish to also consider provision for vulnerable family members. For example, if you have a vulnerable family member or friend who you wish to inherit, but who has a disability, you can set up a vulnerable person trust in your will, which will mean they will not inherit funds outright. Um, this could be dangerous if, for example, they're unable to handle money. But you'll be able to put the funds in a trust, and then you can choose trustees to manage this trust. You can also support family members who are not considered um, vulnerable or disabled under the legal definition. For example, um, if a family member or a potential beneficiary has a history of gambling addiction, you could also put funds in trust for them. If you have a particularly large estate where inheritance tax is payable, we can also give advice on inheritance tax planning. And you may be able to reduce or avoid inheritance tax, depending on how your will is drafted and what your assets are. Now, I'm sure in the current circumstances, it may have suddenly become a worry to put something in, in place um, in case the worst happens. Even though the country is on lockdown with social distancing measures in place, it is still possible to get your will executed by us while adhering to the government guidelines, which we'll explain a bit more about later. 
Um, I'll just pass it over to Sue, who will explain um, a few things that may happen if you don't make your will. Hi, sorry about this. David, I was going to say, if you've got anything to add, please do. Um, obviously, if you don't make a will, then the, the rules of intestacy apply. And there, there's what's known as the statutory trusts in this case. And it all depends on whether or not you're married or you're in a civil partnership or if you have children or other relatives who, who will actually inherit. Um, it, it's, it can actually be um, cause real problems on intestacy. What I have in my past dealt with a number of estates where um, particularly wives have been in huge difficulties because they haven't even been able to inherit the, the family home. There's also um, a situation where the children will inherit at the age of 18, which in many cases might not be advisable um, because um, I don't know what you were like when you were 18, but I probably wasn't as responsible as I am now and I'm still learning to be responsible. Um, the other thing is that it can result ultimately in a huge difference in inheritance tax bills being paid. If you would like any more help um, about this, just please have a word with Amber or, or me. Now, if you, uh, I don't know how many of you have got wills, but if you haven't, may I suggest that you, you do look at that quite urgently. Um, and I don't know when you last made a will, but, but our general rule of thumb is that you should think about reviewing your wills every three to five years or sooner if there are changes in the law or your personal circumstances have changed. Amber's now going to talk about um, why it's particularly important when you have businesses, which may probably concern you um, to make wills. So um, in the introduction at the beginning, I think a lot of you said that you had um, a limited company and there was um, a couple of sole traders and a partnership and a limited liability partnership. Um, when you own a business, it's, it's important to ensure that this is covered in your will so that um, your wishes are reflected um, in, who, in who the, the business passes to and also how that business is managed. And I'm just going to um, list a couple of considerations for each type. So for, for sole traders, it's important in your will um, to be clear which assets um, are to be transferred with the business um, interest and which assets are to be transferred with the rest of the estate. Um, this is because often sole traders um, intermingle their personal and business assets. Um, the term my business um, can be construed quite widely to cover stock machinery and other equipment or it can be construed narrowly to, and maybe only include the right to use the trade name so it is important in the will to specify um, which assets are included particularly to maximize the inheritance tax relief um, also in in the will for a sole trader you may also wish to specify that the person taking over the business is taking over any liabilities to ensure the liabilities are not borne by the rest of the estate. Um, for a company, in the first instance, um, the company's governing, governing documents, so the memorandum and articles of association of shareholder agreement must be looked at first. Um, these documents um, may provide for the company or other shareholders to have rights of first refusal. However, the documents may also give you other rights, such as the right to appoint someone on your death to be a director or some other role. Um, regarding partnerships, uh, the partnership agreement should be looked at in the first instance. Um, there may be a clause preventing dissolution and death, which um, um, also provides um, the entitlement of the partner who died um, to their estate. Um, unless there's exp express provision in the partnership agreement, then the effect of the death of the partner is to cause that partnership to dissolve. Therefore, interest which a testator may pass on in his will is not the right to be a partner, but instead um, an entitlement to a share of the proceeds. Um, you could seek to agree with a former partner to continue the business, but a new partnership will arise between the former partners, 
and the beneficiary in your will. Um, for LLPs, the ability to leave an interest in an LLP in a will will be governed by the terms of the LLP agreement. So this must be consulted first. The agreement may provide for the surviving partners to buy out the testator's interest at a predetermined price or reference to a specified mechanism for determining value. Um, if the agreement does provide for any payment, it may be possible to increase um, the payment by your will, but the specific agreement would need to be looked at at first. Um, regarding the tax position, you may have heard of something called business property relief. Um, this will allow you to either claim 100% or 50% relief from inheritance tax. If you wish to make a will with us, we can advise further. So for example, um, a business carried on by a sole trader generally 100% relief for the business assets. Um, and an interest in a business, e.g. partnership share, is also 100%. Um, it's only available if you've owned the business for two years prior to death. So um, that's something, something to think about. Um, if you own a farming business, um, this would also have to be have to be looked at because agricultural property relief may also be available on top of the business property relief. Um, finally, regarding the trustees in your wills, um, consideration in your will should be given to whether your trustees are given power to carry on the business and if so for how long. So for example, until another person takes over. There's no express provision um, your trustees only have the power to continue as far as necessary to enable it to be sold as a going concern. You may also want to consider more extensive powers to give um, to your trustees, such as the right to receive um, a re remuneration for um, running the business. If appropriate, you may want to consider appointing different business executors to the main executors in your will. Um, I'll pass back to Sue now, who's going to give an overview of the will making process. Hi everyone. Right, um, what we do um, when we are approached by people to make their will is we try to have a face-to-face -face meeting. At the moment, clearly that's, that's more appropriate to over Zoom. Um, we often spend about an hour with with our clients discussing matters and it's extraordinary how many things crop up which one doesn't anticipate even uh, um, when they think it's going to be a simple will you go into it in, in quite a lot of detail they do and uh, they find out it's not so simple they also it's it's quite um it becomes quite an intimate relationship because you find that um, you're told things which, which um, people don't even want their, their accountants to know in some instances. It's not that they have been tax fiddling or anything like that. It's, it's just really pers personal matters. Um, we will often ask you to complete a questionnaire and we will then draft a will when we, we feel we have sufficient information for you to consider. With the will, we give a very extensive explanation of both what the administrative powers mean and also what your will is stating. It's, it's um, quite a daunting process for some people to make a will. And it's extraordinary, I, I think, that some people just put it off. Um, we have a client who has been trying to make his will for at least four years he's worth um, I and mean, i'm not saying anything um which is, is not giving away any client confidentiality but he's he's worth a lot of money i mean some million pounds it was only when he was diagnosed sadly um recently with with an incurable cancer that he actually got down um, and managed to 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 give us instructions he, he'd been living um with a new wife well not in someone he's been with a, with a long time, with children, um, without a will. It was, it was dangerous in my view. So don't put it off. We, we, I don't think any solicitor bites. They just want to help really. Um, we don't make, I mean, to be honest, wills are not something where we 
we make a lot of money out of. We, um, they, they take a lot of time quite often. We, we're not good at streamlining making wills. I wish we were better at that. Um, so when eventually the will is, you're absolutely satisfied with the will, then we will arrange for it to be signed. We will normally do it in our presence. If it's not done in our presence, then we will um, give you strict instructions and we'll also ask you to complete a pro forma form so that there can be absolutely no doubt at a later date if it is ever challenged whether or not that will was properly executed. Um, this morning we saw a lady in the garden, which was quite pleasant. We all kept our distance um, and she signed her, her will. I mean, she'd been putting her will off for a long time, um, but uh, this, this wretched COVID business had, had prompted her to, to get it done. So, um, as I said, please just make your wills if you haven't and just review them. It may be that you don't, if you've made a will, you don't need to, to make a new one, but it's well worth reviewing. Um, the inheritance tax, I don't know what's going to happen in the future because I think everything might change because of the current circumstances and, and the uh, debt that this country is going to be in. But currently there is no tax in almost every case on gifts between spouses or civil partners and you can if, um, if you're married, you can now have a million pounds total on which inheritance tax isn't paid. Thereafter, it's paid at the rate of 40%. If you own a business or a farm, there are also reliefs. Sometimes you can, there's 100% exemption um, on inheritance tax. So we'll now, um, I, I don't know whether you want to, I spoke to Matthew about this earlier, and I don't know whether you want to ask questions now or about that topic before we go on to powers of attorney or if it's better to wait till later on and it obviously depends on the time doesn't it I think that's up to Ma Matthew's call really. Great thank you let's just have a couple of minutes if there's anything on wills particularly as it might affect uh, businesses anyone got, I can't, yes Tracy's waving just to unmute uh that's it. Nope, still not unmuted. There you go. Hello. Yes. Uh, marriage. What does marriage, if you've got a will all set up before marriage, how does that change once you're married? Uh, it's revoked unless you have a clause in your will that it was made in contemplation of that marriage. Okay. Thank you. So it's very important that you, you if if you have married since your last will, that you make a new will. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone and else? divorce also can affect. Yeah. Just, just before we move on, should I? Can I just add one or two points by way to to supplement what um, Sue and Amber have actually said? Um, everything. I agree with absolutely everything they've said, um, and I, I couldn't agree more. Um, and to emphasize the importance of everybody having a will. Um, if you make it with them, fine. Make it with us, fine. Make it with your own solicitor. That's equally fine. The important thing is you get it done. And uh, I think, I can't remember whether it was Sue or uh, Amber that actually said it. The important thing is that this does concentrate the mind at the current time. And it is a task that's not down the bottom of your list. It should be much closer to the top of the list uh, at the current time. That's point one I was going to make. The second point is, is that um, Sue is quite right. No one looks to make very much money out of any wills. It's not, it's, lawyers tend to see this as a, as a, as a, as a way to uh, introduce the client to the business, if you like. Um, but I, I suspect that Ross Carter, like us, probably do this kind of work for fixed prices. Um, rather than on an hourly basis. No one should ever be uh, shy about talking to a lawyer about money these days. Um, indeed, the rules that we are all subject to require us to talk to you about money. So the days of being frightened to come in to see anybody or talk to anybody because it's like writing a blank cheque are long gone. So do please don't be coy about money. 
and I think you'll be pleasantly surprised that actually most of this stuff is fixed price so you know what you're in for right from the very first phone call. Right. Um, two other points that I was just going to make, um, uh, well three points actually, one is uh, the refer there was reference made to um, being clear which assets pass with a business and which pass with um, uh, the, the uh, personal estate for want of a better word. Very good advice. Clarification crops up in many areas in making wills. The point I was going to make is simply don't forget to make use of photographs. If there's any doubt about you know, I leave the picture on my wall to X, well which picture? Well if you've taken a photograph and you refer to the photograph then it's very clear which one you're talking about. Clarity is everything when it talks about specific items. Um, I was also going to make mention of, uh, I think it was a point that Amber made about um, the law implying that in the absence of anything else children will benefit at age 18 and that's quite right uh, and she's equally right in saying that maturity is such that um, there may well be very good reasons to postpone the age at, the, at which um, minors will then benefit 21 25 typically um, that is fine but it is important to know that that can have an impact on some of um, some of the tax relief that is available through uh, a technical thing called the residential nil rate band um, but the fact of the matter is it may be more important to you to make sure that your benefit your intended beneficiary has the level of maturity you want than the tax saving that may go with that but that is something that you would need to talk to your solicitor about uh, and the final point I was just going to make is that it, it's a bit of the elephant in the room really when it comes to um, will writing and that is the spectre of care home fees uh, down the line. Now the fact of the matter is one hears uh, all sorts um, of instructions uh, who, with, with people who come into the office and think well I, I want to give away part of my house or my whole of my house to relatives because I don't want to pay any care home fees. Well that's all very well and good but there are pros and cons of doing that, mostly cons, um, but uh, the fact of the matter is that if you are um, deliberately depriving clinical commissioning bodies of assets through passing them on in that way, there is a power to set them aside. Uh, there are things through a, a, um, a, um, a life interest trust of um, a share of a jointly owned house that can be employed, but the, but the main reason for that really is about protection against remarriage of a uh, of, of a, a spouse and uh, potentially protecting uh, the children of a first marriage for example second marriages uh, creates a whole new raft of different issues when it comes to will writing but i but i agree and support everything that sue and amber have said to date Quiet. So, can you hear me now? I can. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, that's it. So, now, so, so now we're going to introduce us to lasting power of attorney now. Right. I don't know um, um, how many of you have lasting powers of attorney or have considered them, but you probably heard quite a lot about them. It's a lasting power of attorney is a legal mechanism by which the person making the, the document, the power, is, who is known as the attorney, can appoint one or four more persons to act as their attorney. The advantage of making them is that provided they are registered, you can still, the attorneys can still act if the donor becomes mentally incapacitated. This doesn't happen with an ordinary power of attorney because incapacity, once, once the donors become incapacitated, the attorney can't act. There are two types of lasting powers of attorney. We're going to concentrate on one today, but the two types are for property and affairs, which obviously includes business matters, and health and care. Now, under a property one, you can 
act even if the donor is in don't you can act once it's been registered but under a health and care one thanks dan um under a health and care one you can't the capacity of the donor is still relevant they are becoming um i'm finding that more and more doctors and hospitals are wanting to know whether their patients have made um, lasting powers of attorney. Um, I have a case recently where one of my clients has been in hospital and we sent the power of attorney to the hospital. She's been transferred to another hospital and they have sent the power of attorney on. So that's, that's quite, quite, um, it's quite organized for a hospital actually. Um, an LPA it actually covers your assets in England and Wales. That's not to say it won't cover your assets in other countries, but it definitely will cover them in, in, in England and Wales. If you have other assets in a different jurisdiction, then it's sensible to take advice there. Be, just to make sure that, it, that the, 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 your power of attorney here will cover it because it might not. You also, you can make powers of attorney to cover business matters. You could make a power of attorney to cover a particular house. You can be quite restrictive with the powers of attorney or you can make a general one. Now an attorney can be anyone who's over the age of 18, provided of course they have capacity. They're not, they've not been made bankrupt or subject to a debt relief. You must ensure that any attorney you may, you appoint, has the skills and to deal with your assets and also is completely trustworthy. There are a huge number of cases which come up because attorneys have, have not acted properly. It wastes a huge sums of money when that happens. Then you also can decide whether you want to give your attorneys joint power, joint and several power, or joint power to some matters and joint and several to other matters. My view is, and the view of most lawyers is, that it's better to give your attorneys joint and several. The reason for that is that if you appoint them jointly and one of them is unable to act, then the other joint attorney can't act. I mean, the whole purpose of being joint is that they have to act together all the time. So, that's doubly important really to to ensure that your attorneys are trustworthy attorneys can act on a whole host of matters they can buy and sell your house they can open bank accounts they can find out exactly what you're worth provided of course you haven't placed any restrictions on your on your document the power of attorney you can include instructions on the power of attorney and you can also make preferences. Now your instructions can be, cover all sorts of things. They can say that you want your accounts to be seen by a firm of, of accountants because all attorneys have a duty to keep financial accounts. You can also say, which I don't think is a good idea, that your attorneys can't act unless you become mentally incapable. And the reason why that is probably not the best thing is because you might be struck, struck in Singapore with a COVID problem and your attorneys over here will need to, to help, help you with matters. Um, please don't expect your attorneys to make large gifts because they can't. They can only really make gifts which you would customarily have made. They can make gifts to charities, which you would normally have made. They can make Christmas gifts to grandchildren, um, but, but in, the normal, in the normal sphere of what you would normally have made. Now, as I said, it's possible to make more than one LPA, and I shall deal with LPAs on business matters in a short while. Um, and Amber's going to speak now about why it's, give you a few more reasons of why, about why it is important to make powers returning.
So these are very useful documents to make and without them your family members and loved ones um, may find it difficult to find out information. Um, this could be from, for example, the bank or the hospital or, or the care home, um, if relevant, and so forth. Um, without such documents, um, your wishes may not be honoured. For example, you may have a specific wish about life-sustaining treatment. And the health and care um, lasting power of attorney allows you to specify um, whether or not the attorney, attorneys can make that decision on your behalf. Equally, your family members and loved ones may be unsure of what to do in such a scenario and the document um, will confirm whether or not you'd like them to make that decision. Um, another concern you may have is if you develop a health condition which will mean you're unable to manage your money or your investments um, or your bills and so forth, um, it will be more difficult for your family members to take over management of such affairs without the correct documentation in place. Um, it is possible um, to get round this if, if you haven't made lasting powers of attorney, um, but you don't really want to be to be in this position. Um, it involves applying to the Court of Protection um, for a deputyship order, which is um, quite a bit more expensive than making lasting powers of attorney. Um, it's a more rigorous process and it would take a lot longer, so it would cause you um, quite a lot of inconvenience. Um, I'll pass back to Sue now, who's going to talk about lasting powers of attorney in the context of your businesses. Hi. We're just trying to give you an overview, overview today. There's so much more to this subject and to wills and trusts and everything, as you probably realise. Right. I expect you have considered making an LPA or thought about what would happen to your business if you're unable to run it for a while. So you can make an LBA to cover business interests in most cases. It does depend upon what restrictions you make in your LBA. If you're in a company, what the articles of association state and in the partnership, what the partnership agreement states. It is relatively common for a donor to make a specific LBA for a business purpose. These are known as commercials LPA colloquially. But, and you can also, if you make a, a power of attorney for business purposes and one for personal or other financial matters, you can have different attorneys. You don't have to have the same ones. The important thing though is to make sure that they both will work for you and that there's not going to be an over, overlap because that could cause some problems, I think. If you are a sole trader, the general authority to act under an LPA will allow an attorney to act, subject to any restrictions in, in the document. If you are a partner in a business, the partnership agreement must be considered to see whether there are any restrictions on an LPA attorney acting on behalf of the partner. Often partnership agreements will have um, a clause in them that if one of the partners die, there is first call on buying the interest, the deceased interest on the other surviving partners. In the absence of a partnership agreement, then the Partnership Act 1890 applies. On an application by a partner, the court may decree a dissolution of the partnership when a partner becomes permanently incapable of performing his part of the partnership contract, or whenever circumstances have arisen, which in the opinion of the court, render it just and equitable that the partnership be dissolved. If you are a director of a company, it is likely that the general authority of an LP attorney will not extend to carrying out the duties of the donor in this capacity. A director's appointment is personal and may only be, be discharged by the person holding that office. The office of a director is not a property right capable of being exercised by an attorney or other substitute or delegate of the person holding that office. If model articles are used, directors must act as a board and appoint an attorney to act on behalf of the company and not an 
no, excuse me, and not an individual director. It's quite interesting, well, I find it quite interesting um, in this next point is because since um, April 2013, um, when an amendment was made to the model, model articles, um, it revoked the previous article for private companies limited by shares and by guarantees under which a person would automatically cease to be a director upon mental incapacity. These days that doesn't happen so it's very very important that you address that issue if you have adopted those articles. Um, if you don't, if you have, then you could be placed in a position where you have a director who has lost it um, and you basically have to go to the courts to get that director removed. Um, that very, very brief summary of the situation. Um, I'm, I know you uh, said you were going to put notes of this or a recording of this, but we're very happy to put notes up, um, which might be easier for people to read rather than um, my diatribe. Great, thanks. If thanks. you have any questions on Grammar or OI, please let us know. Great, so Vicky, I'll uh, unmute everyone. and um, Just got a, two minutes left. As you know, we finished promptly at four, just to respect the fact it is a business support hour. But as Sue just said, please, uh, if you have a question for them, uh, contact uh, Ross Carter Direct or come through us, contact at nfbp.org.uk. So two minutes left. Anyone? quick point to make just wanted to raise a very quick question if i may matthew uh both jane porter and i have worked uh, and or in some cases do work with dementia uh living uh, well with dementia etc um, i just wonder if there are any implications uh with regards to your discussions uh, in that particular area yeah thank you <clears throat> so sorry could you repeat that i'm not sure i quite understood what you said you worked in dementia. Yeah, I think the question is, are there any implications of putting together these documentation for someone who is affected by dementia? Um, if they, they have to have capacity to, to do it. Um, there is the strict rules, there's a law um, on what is capacity. Um, we will, if we're not sure someone has capacity or not, we will ask, um, a geriatrician who specialises in this area um, to see the client and for him to form his view. There is an issue about whether that's right or whether the lawyer should be able to assess capacity, but it's a difficult one. I, I had one case where I, it was a, a, an elderly um, client who had one child only, he didn't live in this country. And she was desperate for her mother to make um, a lost in power of attorney. Our assessment on the first two, three times of seeing her on quest, and it, it has to be the donor's wish that these documents were made. I just didn't think that he would be able to do it. Um, I thought the only way that she might possibly be able to make it if we saw this lady a lot, because she had a memory problem, and um, which the daughter begged us to do it. I explained that it might be a waste of money and that we would want um, a doctor, this very, very good doctor who's very good on this, to assess her mother. But she passed. Um, I was quite surprised. And um, so she made it. It was more expensive than usual, but it does mean that her affairs are being looked after by her daughter. Um, which is obviously costing a lot less money and the daughter it, it seems to me to be a very loving lady uh, and wants the best for her, her mother. Great, thanks so Sue. It, it's, it's a yeah. problem, otherwise you have to go. Great. I'm afraid that takes us to the end, but I uh, appreciate everything you've shared with us today. It just gets people thinking and of course the time that we're at at the moment is getting people thinking. So please do follow up. Um, there are a number of NFBP member businesses um, and two of, them, two of them are on the call, uh, the solicitors, uh, and others are available as well. But uh, the important thing, I guess, that we do in the New Forest is please don't just go online and use some company up country. 
stay local and support each other. And if you wish to follow up with Sue and Amber, please do. Uh, David's there at uh, Eric Robinson and there, and I'm sure there are others around, but please use and support local businesses. Next week, 13th of May, um, Heidi is going to tackle all things HR for us. Um, a lot may change over this weekend. We may have people start thinking about how do you get someone off furlough? We had to discover what the word meant um, a few months, a few weeks ago, and how do you undo all that and do that properly? What about if someone has holiday time? What if this, what if that? There's all sorts of things going around uh, HR. If, even if you don't have employees, remember if you're a director, you're an employee and so on. So other questions about that? Now there's, there's a whole range, but if you look on the booking page, there's an indication of some of the things that um, Heidi's gonna cover. And I guess if there's something else you'd like, just pop her an email, uh, she, uh, she'll put it in the chat there, Heidi at viewhr.co.uk, um, and then perhaps collate if there's two or three common topics, we can bring those through. Thanks everyone for your time. So HR next week, uh, and then the following week, Dan will be here to solve all your financial problems. Great, thank you very much. Thanks, Matthew. Thank you, Matthew. Thank you.